All right. So uh, the first thing, uh, sorry, I got a pop up there, that I would like to acknowledge with, is that this year the city actually did a proclamation for International Women's Day. So I'm not going to read this whole thing out to you, but you can look at uh, look into it yourself if you'd like, but that fifth paragraph there, it does name um, a couple of women that I will be talking about in this um, presentation, mainly earlier women in New Westminster. Um, but in this presentation, I've taken a little bit of a different approach where um, I'm talking about women of all different kinds of um, backgrounds and you know jobs and uh, personalities. And so there's a little bit, um, I've delved a little bit deeper basically. So a bit of an outline for tonight. Uh, as I mentioned, I'll be talking about 11 uh, wonderful individuals and I'll be sharing their names, um, some photos uh, and some stories um, either that we have found through research or that they've shared with us. Um, so a little bit of a note on content. Um, through research, we've been able to gather some portraits, portraits, some relevant photos, uh, we have some interview excerpts and also some archival records to share with you. And um, by nature of research, you'll find that we have a lot of information on some women and a little bit of inf information on others. And um, I still wanted to share um, some of the women who have uh, less information because they are still um, very significant and you'll see why. So an just an additional um, couple of notes here. Um, I know this might be a question, uh, how and why were the individuals chosen? So the individuals in the presentation were identified through research completed uh, through the years by museum staff and volunteers, and also, also through relationships um, that the museum has built over time. All this to say 11 women, like that's a, that's a small selection of women. They're incredible um, individuals, um, but definitely uh, we're just scratching the surface tonight. So um, we welcome any awareness and information uh, on women in New Westminster that any of you um, have and would like to share with us. A little note on uh, the program purpose. So in the, in the program description, you will have seen um, the word contributions. And I just wanna talk a little bit more about this. So it is of course, very important to acknowledge um, the community contributions of the women in the presentation today. Um, many of them were first to something, barrier breakers, and each have incredible um, strength of character and spirit. However, I would like to acknowledge that um, individuals are more than the challenges that they were forced to meet. And so I'm going to do my very best to also honor the women for who they are, um, who they fearlessly were, are and continue to be, because I think it's really important to acknowledge that impact flows when people are just fearlessly themselves. So I'm gonna do my best to highlight personalities when I can. And lucky for us, um, we have some people who can actually share that with us directly who are on the Zoom tonight. And uh, one more slide before I actually get into the, uh, into the, the women, um, just some acknowledgements. So I would really like to acknowledge Juana Capota, who is the uh, museum's curator and also uh, her curatorial, curatorial volunteers. Um, much of the research that I'm sharing this evening is a compilation of their hard work that they've done over many years. So oftentimes we do this research, it sits for a while, and then we finally find an opportunity to share it. And um, I wish she was here to show it with us, but she's in Vienna. So <laughs> I'm going to do my very best. Um, I would like to uh, thank Grace Yip and also Cornelia Naylor. Grace, who is Susie Chu's sister, um, and she is on the call tonight, um, who is very kind to speak with me about Susie and her life over the phone, and also provide a, um, a really neat photo, which I'll talk about uh, later in the presentation. Um, I wanted to thank the record because um, they did a wonderful two part article on on Susie in 2017 and this was called the unbreakable Susie Chu. And so this is still available online if you'd like to read it it's really uh, a fascinating and beautiful read. 
I'd like to thank Missy Puri and her family. Um, she's one of the women that I'll be uh, talking about uh, tonight. Um, Mrs. Puri was also very kind to speak with me over the telephone and uh, share a little bit about her life. And um, I'm really glad that she joined us, although she was extremely humble, I will say. <laughs> um, and also uh, Belle for helping out with uh, sharing of information and providing um, photos uh, for this presentation. Okay, so this is our first um, woman of the evening, Elizabeth Emmeline Forrester. So this is her here. So Elizabeth is one of New West's earliest Black settler residents that we have on record. Um, the other is her husband, Thomas Forrester, and both actually arrived here in New Westminster in 1864. Elizabeth herself uh, was from New York. I believe Thomas was um, from Florida, but they both lived on Agnes Street near 6th Street. As I said, I'm gonna try my best to share some tidbits of personalities with you. Um, this quote is actually, I'm a little bit um, curious about this quote and I'd like to know more, um, but it's a quote from newspaper research of a kind of local uh, historian. Um, and I believe it's from somebody who knew um, Thomas Forster. But I like this quote because it shows, um, first of all, a married couple, but um, her strong and humorous character. So I'll just read it out to you. Uh, Tommy was new to the racing game, and he thought the race went to the rider with the heaviest whip. This frightened his horse, and it bolted up a side street, coming to a sudden stop against a high board fence. But Tommy didn't stop. He kept on going over the fence, landing in a beautiful stand of corn belonging to Mrs. Forrester. Mrs. Forrester was, a ver was very proud of her corn patch, and seeing it sadly flattened by the prostrate form of a young, young jockey, uh, she proceeded to give the culprit a sound thrashing. So this sounds bad, but it's it's sort of a quirky sort of moment between a married couple. And it sounds like she had a very formidable spirit. Here's another photo of her here. Um, she does seem like a very strong woman to, to me. So this is a, a note um, in the Mainland Guardian in 1883 about her passing. And I've actually transcribed it on the next page here so we can get a better look. Um, and I won't again read the whole thing, uh, but I like this because it shows how well loved and respected uh, she was in the community. So I'll read the one section. Uh, her petite figure, generally provided with a small hat, was a familiar object in our streets, and everybody knew and liked her. She does, by her departure, create a void in our community. She was of a kindly, generous nature and favored for her attention to detail. So you can really see that she was, you know, missed in the community when she did pass. And she is actually buried in Fraser Cemetery here. Uh, and I believe that was in 1883 because she passed um, when she was 57 years old. The next individual we'll be speaking about is Maria Holland J. Curie. So this is Maria here. So she is on record as an early uh, female entrepreneur. And in the archives, um, it says that this photo is from 1859, but I don't think that's possible because she's much older in this photo. Um, and she didn't, she came to New West in 1859 or 1860. A little bit about her. So Maria, Maria Holland Curie, she was born into the Holland family in Dublin in 1824. She had a bit of a hard home life. Um, her mother was blind and her father was a well-educated man, but he was a bit of a bully. He was kind of cruel. Um, and so she actually left home at 17 to escape her father where she traveled to England and she worked as a domestic servant there. In the 1850s, she actually went to Gibraltar, where she learned Spanish, and this is where she married her first husband. But there's sort of a funny family legend where um, in the 1850s, sorry, when she was there, um, she met another man, an Irish man named James Curie, and the two men actually dueled over her. <laughs> uh, she did end up marrying James Curie. And the two uh, left uh, for the colony of BC uh, to escape the scandal. So he arrived here as a royal engineer in 1859, and she followed, uh, I believe, a year afterwards on the Euphrates around Cape Horn with their six, six month old son, William Holland Curie, which again would have been in 1860. 
So why is she on record as sort of being a bit of a businesswoman? This photo above here, this is um, 1866 uh, New Westminster from uh, the Fraser River looking forward. It's a kind of common photo that's shown um, about New West, but that sort of enlarged bit there, you can see it says the Telegraph House. And on the left there, there's an ad um, for the Telegraph House. So in 1871, James Curie unfortunately passes away in um, a kind of a violent horse-drawn wagon accident. Um, and so we know by the records on the left there, which is actually that as from 1872, that she um, took over the operations of the Telegraph Hotel, which was in his control previously. Uh, in 1887, uh, Maria then buys land and commissions the construction of some rental homes. Um, and through the volunteer uh, research that I mentioned, we know that uh, she turned the home at 431 Agnes Street into a successful boarding house for bachelors. And then she moved to invest in other properties. And this was two rental homes on Carnarvon Street, which was they were constructed for $1,500 each. And a little bit of context for that time. Um, New Westminster was named as a freshwater terminus uh, for the railway. And uh, there was a bit of an economic boom, but also a housing crisis. So we were able to rent things um, for quite a high price. price. So she did really uh, well for herself. This is just um, acknowledging that she passed away at age 88. This is uh, the Daily News, 1911. But just to note on those uh, rental properties that I mentioned, one of them is actually uh, still used and operated today. So 305 Carnarvon Street is um, sort of a marriage of heritage conservation and serving the community. So it's actually a halfway house, which helps to transition adult men either out of prison or of uh, homelessness. So it's kind of interesting that that's still having an impact on the community today. The next individual I wish we had more information on, but it's one of those that we just have tidbits. So Mrs. Kirkwood. Mrs. Kirkwood is significant because even though we have so little on her, she is the first known, so on record, female business owner in 1863. And as you can see, she was a dressmaker. So we just have this one little snippet of her, but it is still significant nevertheless. The next, next individual is Flora Amelia Ross. This is Flora here. So Flora was uh, the first matron of number nine Woodlands. Uh, this photo here is from 1875. Flora came from a fur trade family and her father was the chief trader uh, for the Hudson's Bay Company at Fort McLaughlin. And her mother was the daughter of a trader and an Ojibwe woman. Uh, she married a Paul Hubbs in 1859, but he was 40 years her senior. He apparently was also a bit of a bully. Um, but with her, uh, her independent spirit, she actually left him uh, in 1870 and took their son and changed their names um, to her maiden name, which was Ross. She was appointed matron of the Victoria Jail in 1872 and actually moved to the Songhees Reserve out there. In 1878, she came to New Westminster, and this is where she began her work, her work at Woodlands um, at the asylum. So apparently an E.A. Sharp was also not very nice to her at work and uh, demeaned her in her position. However, um, she was very well respected in her job and maintained a lot of authority. So by 1893, she had four assistant matrons and 41 patients under her direct supervision. The women's ward at Woodlands was described as one of the bright spots in the institution by a medical superintendent in 1895, and it was actually her dying wish to, to pass away there, which is what happened. Her Indigenous uh, heritage and identity is a little bit unclear. In one um, reference, she is noted as Métis, uh, whereas I mentioned before in another, she is noted as, um, I guess it would be the grandchild of an Ojibwe woman. So um, that is a little bit of, of a mystery still. Lizzie Chan is again, one of those where we have so little, but it makes me so interested to know more. So Lizzie Chan is the earliest Chinese Canadian uh, female business owner on record in New Westminster. 
So um, this is from 1906 and the local paper did actually write about her. So we have a little bit more information on her. So you can say, see here, um, Mrs. Lizzie Chan has opened up a first class restaurant on Carnarvon Street between 10th and McGuinness Streets and will attend to the hungry public in person. Mrs. Chan is a native of British Columbia and was educated in the public schools of New Westminster. So just a little bit of, of information, but a very significant individual in terms of firsts. Janet Kathleen Gilley is the next individual. And we'll start with a sort of a younger photo here. This is uh, Janet on the left. She's about 11. That's her sister, um, Grace. Yes, her sister, Grace. So I'll start with a little bit of an anecdotal um, story, kind of a quote. So in the Great Fire of 1898, um, there's a story about her mother continuing to shout, don't let me forget the baby, when they're trying to escape the home and make sure that their house is not taken by the fire. Luckily, um, the house at 403 uh, George Street did survive the fire, as did Janet, and thank goodness that she did. So this photo here uh, is of Janet Gilley in 1922, and she was actually the 15th woman to receive a law degree from the University of British Columbia. And this photo is likely uh, being taken on the day that she was called to the bar in 1922. So again, one of those firsts. So Janet, um, in terms of how she got into law, the two Whiteside brothers, William James and David, practiced in New Westminster and Janet worked for them at one time. She had the highest regard for them and according to some of her relatives, this was how she became interested in law. Janet was also friends with Jean Whiteside, William's daughter, who was called to the bar just a few weeks after Janet was, uh, was called, so another early woman working in law. Um, the two often traveled from New West to Vancouver together. Uh, she practiced in New West, uh, Janet did, uh, from 1924 until she retired uh, in 1972. So she actually had a very full career. Her first job after finishing law school was with Whiteside, Edmonds and Whiteside. And by 1925, she was actually practicing on her own. Uh, from the beginning, she knew uh, that uh, it would be risky advertising that she was a woman. And there is a story that um, the sign on her door actually just read JK Gilly, so that there was no, um, there was no sign of her gender. So uh, she's on record as, as noting uh, that this often elicited mixed reactions. So some people were very surprised when they actually met her and discovered that she was a woman. The next individual I'd like to talk about is Dorothy Maccabeek Francis. So this is Dorothy here. So Dorothy was born into Salto First Nation in 1912, which is in Saskatchewan. And uh, her, her story that I'm going to share uh, starts out a little bit sad. Um, and then it kind of, it changes a bit. So in 1953, unfortunately, uh, one of her children did pass away because of inadequate hospital facilities for Indigenous Canadians. The family then moved to Regina, Saskatchewan, but there no one would rent a house to Indigenous Canadians with large families. So they ended up pitching a tent on the outskirts of town. At that time, fewer than 50 Indigenous peoples were in that area. Dorothy Francis, um, through her experience, became uh, very involved in the Regina uh, Native Society and she founded the first Indian Friendship Center. So this photo here is actually uh, Dorothy much later in time, of course, um, in 1978, and she's being uh, recognized or made as a member of the Order of Canada. And she is honored for her work with Indigenous peoples, which I'd like to share a little bit about um, that with you right now. So after spending time in Regina, the family then moved to Winnipeg, Manitoba, where Dorothy Francis worked at the Friendship Centre there, first as a manager of arts and crafts, and then as a family counsellor to Indigenous peoples in the area. She then became an economic development officer and Native cultural worker and was elected uh, chair of National Arts and Crafts Advisory Committee. She also served on the Ontario Arts and Crafts Advisory Board. Dorothy was also actually an artist. Uh, some of her work has been exhibited in the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. And she also hosted a weekly Indigenous cultural program for Canada's national radio network. 
She published a book on Indigenous legends and recorded Indigenous lullabies as well. Her Baha'i faith uh, was very important to her and she became Baha'i in 1960. And I have to say uh, that um, a lot of the information that I came across comes from um, the Baha'i uh, research and, and website and um, autobiographies that they did. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, so for this work, um, with the Baha'i, uh, she did share a lot about her Indigenous identity and committed a lot of her life to that. So that meant a lot to her. So for all of this work that she did, uh, she was recognized as a member of the Order of Canada, as seen in this photo. Now this totem might uh, look a little bit familiar. It is in New Westminster. So it was originally placed in the 1990s in Queens Park. Um, but over time it began to uh, show a bit of wear from exposure to the elements. So in 2018 is actually restored. So Ellen Bendorf, um, who is a member of the Baha'i, as I mentioned, uh, took initiative to have this totem pole restored. So actually a little bit about the, the totem pole itself. So it's seven feet tall and it features a bear holding a shield, which is actually symbolic of her name, Maccabeek, which means sitting bear woman. So this represents the fortitude uh, that she demonstrated in face of difficulties throughout her lifetime. The totem was originally carved by Joseph Norbert Gordel, who was a prison inmate who had met and was actually very inspired um, by her while she was working to uh, implement First Nations programs in correctional institutions. So in 2018, with the support of the city and in commemoration for National Indigenous Peoples Day, the totem was taken down on June 21st and restored professionally by Bear Sam, who is a carver with the Sartlip First Nation in Saanich Peninsula. So um, that is still up there and looks better than ever. I'm so grateful for that. Next individual is Jean Dorgan. And I have to say, it was hard for me to find a picture of Jean where she was not smiling. And so <laughs> I think that speaks a lot to her character just in the photos that we have about her. So this photo here is from the 1940s, but a bit about Jean. Henrietta Jean Dorgan, known as Jean Dorgan, was born in uh, November 15th of 1910 in New West. Uh, she lived in New West until July 1942, when she decided to join the army as a nurse uh, with the medical corps. Before the war, she had been studying uh, to become a nurse at UBC. She joined the army as a lieutenant and by the end of the war became an acting captain. Jean was assigned to the number three mobile surgical unit, which is a casualty clearing station. And this will become significant on the next slide. Um, she served both in Italy and in Northern Europe. So this is Jean here on the left, as you can see, she's laughing. <laughs> um, three nurses, I believe the others, uh, Eileen Williams and Bud Darling uh, Wright. So they serve together. So in early 1944, um, Jean was stationed at the surgical unit, which was 13 kilometers away from uh, Monte Cassino, which is a rocky mountain area um, in the Leary Valley, which is about 130 kilometers southeast of Rome. Um, so this was a natural viewpoint. As a result, it was very central, this is a bit of army history here, but um, very central to the Gustav Line, which was an east-west German defense, um, which blocked allied forces from Rome and northern Italy. And this is important because from January to May of 1944, Allied soldiers from New Zealand, India, Canada, and Poland uh, attacked this area. Uh, the line actually collapsed in May after a barrage of 900 guns and aerial bombardment actually uh, captured the Benedictine Monastery at the top of the mountain range. Uh, it was the longest and bloodiest battle in Italy during World War II. So her unit, the casualty clearing station, received the soldiers from these battles. So she was heavily involved in some very tough stuff. Again, she's in a hospital bed and she's still laughing. <laughs> this is from 1944 and she's actually uh, recovering from pneumonia in this photo and she's laughing at the fellow there getting a haircut. Um, so lucky for us, uh, she did an, do an oral history with the museum and so I'm going to share a few quotes from her. 
So uh, in terms of administering uh, morphine in Monte Cassino, she sort of has a, an interesting story about this. Uh, so she says, someone said to me, you've given all this morphine without any orders. And I said, where am I going to get the orders? Well, they're supposed to be given by a doctor. And I said, <laughs> the doctors are all in the OR and they don't want to be bothered by me. Do you think they're going to court martial me because I used my head? We were different, um, but nurses uh, get an order from a doctor. But in a situation like that, I wasn't going to leave men in pain for hours and pain can cause shock. But actually the soldiers needed very little medication and they were just so tired and happy to get into a hospital bed. So to me, this, this shows that she was a very quick thinker and a compassionate person. When asked how Jean observes Remembrance Day, uh, she told a very interesting story. She says, well, I go to City Hall. I haven't always gone, but I wear my medal. And someone asked me, do you wear that medal for your husband? <laughs> Nobody <laughs> ever wears someone else's medals. And they never asked me if I might have gotten those medals myself. Um, this kind of, this made me laugh, but it's also very telling for sure. So what did Jean do after the war? She says she took off for Toronto right away. I never went back to my job in Vancouver and I think that was the right thing to do to make a complete change. And after the war, she actually received a master's degree. She taught nursing at the University of Toronto. And after working in Ottawa for many years with the Ministry of Health, she retired and moved back to New West. Uh, she volunteered at Irving House for many years as well. And she passed away in uh, 2008. The next individual I'd like to talk about is Sui Susan Susie Chu. So Susie has her nickta nickname there, she's so lovingly remembered as. Um, so before I go into the next slides here again, I would really like to thank Grace, um, Susie's sister, for chatting with me on the phone, and also uh, Cornelia for her work in the record. It was a helpful reference for me for sure. And again, it is a beautiful read if anyone gets the, the chance and uh, lots more pictures to look at as well. So this photo here was shared um, with me uh, it's from Grace and I did my best to kind of um, fix the contrast there, but this is a family photo. And Grace is the, in the middle there with mom's hands on her shoulders. She's about four years old here. So if you see the, uh, the writing there, it says Canada passport photo, 1931 deportation to China. So first, the reason why I had this photo, which I think is interesting, is I, I asked Grace if she had any photos of Susie as a young girl. <laughs> and um, I said, oh, I'm not sure. And I think this is the only one that the family has of her, is what she told me. Um, but this photo itself has an interesting story, which Grace shared with me. So gr during the Great Depression, immigration was slow. And I, I did a little bit more reading on this. Um, was slow, and uh, but deportation actually accelerated. Um, as Grace shared with me, the government uh, was deporting um, people who were unemployed. Um, looking back, this, of course, was quite a racist policy. However, um, deportation never happened. Thank goodness it didn't. Um, Susie, mom and brothers uh, and sisters were not deported. And uh, Grace had shared with me that the, the known reason for this was that it was too costly and the ships were else, actually needed elsewhere. Um, so sort of a, a fascinating story there. Thank goodness it didn't happen um, because now we can share uh, Susie's wonderful life in New Westminster and beyond. So how did she end up in New West? So uh, Susie moved to New West at age 20 to help her sister Alice run the Handy Fruit Mart on 6th and 6th. Uh, Susie took over the mart in 1946 and in 1955 uh, she opened the Waffle House uh, right before which Cornelia in her article she kind of identifies this um, before the women's rights movement of the 1960s or before the repeal of Canada's infamous Chinese Exclusion Act. And so what an independent and tenacious spirit. <laughs> it's just amazing to me. Um, according to Grace, she opened this restaurant uh, with six to 12 shares and a coffee machine. So super fascinating. I love this photo here. Um, this is a photograph of uh, Susie with Jack Kyle of CKNW. And a uh, story goes that Susie often hosted uh, CKNW and the Columbian reporters and many community members at the Waffle House. It was really a, a community spot where people would gather and, and talk to one another. 
Another story um, that is shared um, that is relevant um, to this photo here is that when Susie and her roommate were uh, rejected from renting an apartment based on her own ethnicity, um, she was encouraged to speak up by uh, the radio station and the newspaper and by community members as well. And in March of uh, 1956, she did with her roommate uh, get an apartment. Um, I believe it was at the Bermuda House, which is on 8th Ave, which is now called the Hillcrest. So when I was talking to Grace on the phone, um, I was curious about what Susie is most proud of or what means the most to her um, about her time in New Westminster and what really you know, stuck with her. So of course she was proud of the Waffle House, um, but she was also very uh, proud of her time as a club leader, a cub leader, excuse me. Um, she got to the Akeda level, which is a master level. She really loved to engage people. So she loved teaching hula uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, she fundraised. So one example of this was fundraising for flood victims of the Fraser Valley flood in 1948. And she was very involved in community clubs. So for instance, with tennis and, and skating. Uh, later in her life, Susie did move to uh, Toronto and opened up her own fashion business. So she continued to try new things and explore um, new avenues. Uh, into her 70s even, she learned to, to paint watercolors and she did put on um, multiple art shows in Toronto and continued to put on hula shows and uh, teach people about that. And Grace did share with me that uh, for her 90th birthday, they rented out the Waffle House um, and had a birthday party for there. Uh, for, for Susie there, and the mayor and many community members um, and family were able to attend. So to me, it, she just seemed like a very tenacious and happy spirit, and I'm so uh, honored to be able to recognize her in this presentation and to meet um, some of her family. So the next individual I'd like to share with you is Mayor Beth Wood. So talking about firsts, uh, Beth Wood is the first female mayor in New Westminster before this in the 50s. She was an alderman or councillor and she actually became mayor in 1959. So this photo is uh, her first oath of office as, as mayor and she's sort of kissing the Bible here with a George Brine in her, in her robes. I had no reason to really include this photo. I just really love this photo. <laughs> I think it just shows her, her humor and how awesome she was. Um, this is in 1960 and uh, the caption is, Calamity Jane and Dead-Eyed Ted, alias police commissioners, Mayor Beth Wood and Lieutenant Colonel E.G. Eakins shoot it out at City Hall Wednesday night. The occasion was the opening of a 60 foot revolver range built by police department and civil defense workers. So um, again, it was very hard to find a photo where she, she was not smiling too. Um, so the personalities of everyone really show. Again, she was the first mayor, but she was involved in many other things. So for instance, um, Beth Wood was appointed as one of the first board of governors of Simon Fraser University, which would have been appointment by the Lieutenant Governor in council. And I like this photo here because um, this is a significant gesture um, during her time as mayor. So she was actually the first to sign a sister city agreement. So this photo is in uh, 1963 and she's walking down City Hall Lane um, along sort of parallel to Royal Avenue there with Mayor Masataka Kizaki of Moriguchi, Japan for the opening of the Friendship Gardens there. So this is quite a significant thing um, for a mayor to do and she was the first, so just awesome to see. And the last individual I'd like to share is um, Nassib Korpuri or Mrs. Puri as I like to respectfully say. <laughs> and again, um, Thank you so much to Mrs. Puri for talking with me on the telephone and sharing her stories and photos, despite how, how humble you are. <laughs> and I know she's on the call, so I'm very grateful that you're here. I'm very excited that you're here. So Mrs. Puri, this is the photo I was talking about that I had um, that you hadn't seen. So this is from 1981, and this is a Hayek Festival Association annual dinner. So um, you can see she's in the polka dots and the white collar there. So born in Duncan, um, a few years after her mother's arrival in Canada, I believe she was four years old when she and her parents moved to New Westminster. 
1950, Mrs. Puri became the first girl of Indian descent to graduate from her newest minister high school, which was the Duke of Connaught High School. After graduation, uh, she began a 40 year career in banking where she landed a job at Royal Bank. And I think that she believes that she was also the first um, woman of Indian descent to work at, work at a new Westminster bank as well. So another first there. Um, I did ask her where this drive comes from. I said, do you think this came from your family? And um, it seems to be uh, a drive that really comes from within herself. And you'll see um, where this continued to, to take her over time. So in 1952, um, she was married uh, to her husband and they have two children, Belle and Darcy. In terms of uh, work in New Westminster, when I asked Mrs. Puri uh, what she's most proud of or what means um, a lot to her, she shared a little bit about her work in the Punjabi community here in New Westminster. And uh, some of this was actually translation work, which um, is quite amazing. So because she could read and write in Punjabi, she assisted in uh, translating a few things. The first was making an information um, booklet, and this was in the 70s, um, for parents and, and teachers in the schools so that there could be improved communication um, between the two, translating report cards as well. Uh, and also this booklet, uh, she had mentioned that she still has it and that it makes her quite happy uh, to look at it. So it would be really neat for us to to see that one day and if tonight if it's nearby it could be kind of nice. Um, she also translated tax forms into Punjabi uh, for community members in order to ease that process for them. Some of her other uh, New Westminster involvements include serving as the director of the Hayek Festival. Um, so again, this photo is um, from the Hayek Association, assisting with May Day as a chaperone and a prompter to the, the May Queen, serving on the PTA in which they would hold lunches and actually be able to speak to the local MLA and um, share their ideas and their concerns. She served on the city's board of variance committee among many other boards. So this is a photo here um, from her, and this is from 1993, which was the 125th anniversary commemorative medal. So this uh, was issued to commemorate the 125th anniversary of the Confederation of Canada. Um, and it's a medal that honors Canadians who have made significant contributions to their fellow citizens, to their community or to Canada. It was awarded to civilians as well as members of the military, recognizing Canadians from all walks of life, from every region of Canada and from various backgrounds and disciplines. So a huge honor there in 1993. I'd love to hear a little bit more um, from her if, if anything, if there are any memories about this. This here is a big one. So this is um, in 1999, um, and this is the Governor General's A Caring Canadian Award. And so this is um, her with the Lieutenant Governor Guard Gardam in this year. And so her volunteer work has been local, as I mentioned, a lot of contributions in New Westminster, um, but also international. So the recognition also matches this. So for this award, she was recognized for her work on the Hayek Association and her May Day work, as I mentioned, but also as the YMCA uh, director or a YMC director. She was recognized for raising funds to support projects in the developing world and organized annual events such as fashion shows and dinners to support projects that benefit refugees, children in need and teens at risk. And one uh, memory and um, meaningful experience from this that she actually shared with me on the phone um, was part of this fundraising, fundraising work, excuse me, for developing countries was the installation of wells in Zimbabwe. And I think she, you had mentioned um, that uh, from your time on the International Development Committee when, um, when these events happened and uh, funds were raised that the money would be matched um, by CETA. And so it could really contribute to this, this goal that everybody had. And this will be the last slide before Q&A. Um, but this is another acknowledgement here, and uh, this is from 2014 um, with Surrey Mayor, or previous uh, Mayor, Diane Watts, and this is um, 
at the 100 Journey Awards, which is an event that recognizes the accomplishments of past, present, and future notable Indo-Canadians. So clearly one of those deserving individuals, a huge impact on the New West community here and also in Canada. So I'm so happy that I could uh, recognize her um, tonight in New Westminster and so happy that you're here on the call as well. So I'm done talking. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I'll stop to uh, share, stop my sh uh, screen sharing here and we can go into the Q&A. I see some, some comments in the chat there. You are correct, active in our community for quite some time and we will learn about her contributions. Oh, who was that about? Regarding Belle and Nisbe. Oh, yeah, yes. yes Both yeah. remarkable individuals. Nasib, yes. Are there any questions about anything? Or maybe comments? I would love to hear because there are some, some people on this call who are either one of the, the women that I spoke about or family members. Any questions? Did anyone sort of learn about uh, an individual that they hadn't heard about before tonight? I'd be really curious as a person in heritage, who was that individual? Oh, I can't hear you. There you go. <laughs> Janet Gilly and Beth Wood. I remember okay. them quite well and their work within the city and the positions they held are remarkable people. Just glad what, to say what, I was able to, able to be in touch with them. Actually, what, Janet, Janet Gilly did the probate for my mom's uh, will. So Really? Uh, yeah. Oh my goodness, what an interesting connection. Yes, I That's remember so cool. her quite well and, and also Beth Wood. Tamara, do you want to try again? See if we can hear you. Yeah, I'm going to have to unplug. I don't know why my earbuds don't work. Um, yeah, all of them. Like I, I only moved to Vancouver about 30 years ago, and I've been to New West, but I've never lived there. And you know, I just was looking for something to help me celebrate International Women's Day, and and um, Vancouver didn't offer anything like this. So, you know, why not find out more about a community that I don't really know very much about? Good for you. That's awesome. <laughs> I had only heard of Susie Chu before. Sorry, what do you mean, Emily? I had only of Susie Chu before this. Oh, the first time you heard about Susie was through the article. I think. Yeah, I think that's what she means. Right. I remember yes. Susie quite well. Had many waffles there over my younger days. Oh, we that's so awesome. Always used to stop in there after school and have a waffle. Great. It really did seem like a wonderful community spot. It, it is. It still is. Yes. Grace, do you want to share anything? Yeah, no pressure. Oh, you're muted, hon. Yeah, well, Susie moved to uh, New Westminster as a young girl from a farm in uh, Saanich in Victoria. And uh, when she came to New Westminster, she was 20 and she tried everything. She started taking figure skating lessons and she was one of the first ones to skate in the, the, um, the New Westminster ice folly show in New Westminster and she opened a restaurant in New Westminster and she did a lot of uh, radio station stuff in New Westminster she she and then she opened that restaurant in New Westminster which really was the highlight of one of the highlights of her career thank you so much I'd like to speak about Jean Dorgan um, go ahead as I spent 
many years with her um, when she was volunteer at Irving House when I was a younger uh, employee being a guide. Um, Hold on. Can I interrupt you, Alan? Can you introduce mm -hmm. yourself quickly? Okay. I'm Alan Blair. I've worked at the museum for now on, now slightly more than 30 years. Um, <laughs> and it was actually my mother that helped bring Jean on as a volunteer. She had, New Westminster was her second retirement. She'd gone into um, federal government service late on, later on and then had retired in Ottawa and then decided... She didn't want to be retired in Ottawa after 20 years, so moved to New Westminster. Um, she thought she might have been the first person to give um, antibiotics as a treatment, uh, as, or the first Canadian to give antibiotics. Um, she grew up in New Westminster. You might guess from her name, she was Irish. She was Irish Catholic. So she felt a little bit of a sting of anti-Catholic sentiments, which doesn't really exist, at least to my knowledge, much out here anymore. Uh, but because of that, she, they, and because of her father's interests, um, he brought through the Harlem Globetrotters on a tour. And they weren't allowed to eat in any New Westminster restaurant. After, the, after their match, but the food could be brought up to the Dorgan's house. And so she came down the stairs and the Harlem Globetrotters were in her front room um, having a party after their match at, oh, I'm thinking at that time, probably Douglas College. And she probably would have been friends or knowledgeable with Janet Gilly because her father I believe was a lawyer and was had very similar offices in the Westminster Trust building, but she was a very amazing woman. So I'm glad I got to know her. Oh, I'm loving all these connections. This is so neat. <laughs> Everyone's connected somehow when you look mm -hmm. into it. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and probably would have been, um, probably would have known the Keery family or, sorry, Terry family, as we're supposed to pronounce it. Um, and the Mrs. Carey's uh, husband could be one of the ghosts of Irving House. Are we saying there are ghosts of Irving House? Because that is very scary for me. Who needs to be by myself in there sometimes? <laughs> he, I'm a bit of um, a coward. You all can know that's okay. <laughs> he suffered his very grave injuries on Maryvale Street. Mm -hmm. And is believed to have been brought into the house where yes. he then expired. Yes. Yes. Well. So hopefully he's, it's, I've only experienced the friendly ghost. So. Good. Yes. Friendly anecdotal ghosts are the kinds that I like. <laughs> yes. I see. Uh, yeah. First time I heard of Lizzie Chan tonight. Yes. And we have so little on her. I'd love to find a photo. I bet you somewhere in one of the archives in BC, there must be a photo. Um, but we have yet to come across it. And who knows if we ever will. But again, you know, I would this will be recorded and we'll post it. And hopefully if if people know more or they have additional information, we totally welcome it because it will only improve our understanding of women in our community. So we are at 7.02, um, unless there are any other questions um, or comments that you'd like to make, I think we might leave it there. I'd just like to say that both Rebecca's, you've done a wonderful job. I enjoyed listening to all the histories of all these other ladies that were of that time period and all the early 1800s. It's great, lots of research you've done. Thank you both for being doing this. It's great. Thank oh, you. thank you so much. And again, I credit Juana Capota, who's not here right now, who is our curator and her volunteers. They have been gathering information for so long. And um, it's really nice to use. I mean, there must have been just on women 300 pages or something. So I've only shared just like a little bit of it because I only had an hour. <laughs> so we'll continue to do this, but um, thank you all so much for coming. And um, again, if you have any questions later, you can reach out to us directly. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that next year uh, we'll be able to do uh, another presentation like this. Um, 
but I'd like to, to highlight, um, I think, women making history right now. So for some of the younger women who are doing um, incredible things in a New West community currently and to allow them to share some of their heritage too. So hopefully something to look forward to to the next International Women's Day. She's very good. Yeah. Okay, I think we'll leave it there, Rebecca. Do you wanna uh, stop the Zoom yeah. there? And I'll give a big wave and one last thank you to everybody. <laughs> thank you so 